Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our fifth webinar in the Wisconsin Citizen Lake Monitoring Network Winter Webinar Series. This is Paul Skowinski, the statewide educator for the network. Thanks for joining us to learn all about unique plants today that grow in and around our lakes. I get to run the meeting and today be your presenter. Each one of these webinars is recorded for later viewing. If you've attended other webinars in our series, you, you know all this information already, but uh, they are all posted to our UW Extension Lakes YouTube channel. We have a playlist created there. So all of our webinars from the past are on that playlist as well as the one from today will be there uh, by tonight. And you can find all the different webinars there and decide which ones interest you the most. Feel free to share that link with other people as well and I will put that link in the chat so you'll have it uh, right away and I'll send it in an email later on as well. During the presentation today, please keep yourself muted and turn your webcams off. I see all, all the participants right now are muted with their webcams off, so that's perfect. I'll turn off any webcams that I see pop up just to keep the webinar running as smoothly as we can have it run today. And please post all of your questions into the chat. You're welcome to ask questions during the presentation or at the end. Uh, whenever a question pops into your mind, feel free to put it into the chat box. Next month's webinar it will be our final one in the 2021 winter webinar series, and it will be on March 31st at 3 p.m. Central Time, all about wild rice in Wisconsin. Sarah Dance from UW-Madison will join us to talk about wild rice, so we hope you can join us for that one. All right, so let's talk about some cool plants. Again, this is Paul Skowinski speaking. I'm the statewide educator for the Citizen Lake Monitoring Network and a lakes outreach specialist with Extension Lakes at UW-Stevens Point. I also teach aquatic botany at UW-Stevens Point. Uh, aquatic plants and wetland plants are, are a major interest of mine, so I always have fun talking about this topic. So this should be a fun presentation, I hope. Um, so the way that this presentation will run is each one of the plants that I'm going to talk about, I left the title off of the first slide because I want to see how many of you in the audience know what those species are. I uh, want to see if there's any debate over what the name of that species is. And I'd also like to see if there are common names out there that people call these plants that I haven't heard of before. Uh, one plant may have a half dozen common names to different people or different regions, um, depending on where you grew up uh, or where you live now, you may have different names for them. So I'm curious to see what those names are. Um, so we'll get right to it. First one is this one. I'll give you a few seconds to type in the chat what you think this is. I'm sure there's somebody out there in the in the group that knows what this one is. It's a carnivorous plant. Yep, perfect. I see a couple of pitcher plant answers coming in. This is the purple pitcher plant, Saracenia purpurea. It is our only uh, pitcher plant species here in Wisconsin. If you get into the southeastern part of the United States or certainly into tropical areas of the world, you find a whole lot more diversity in species of pitcher plants with many different shapes and sizes and all kinds of colors. And some of them eat mice and rats. Uh, so they can get pretty big and uh, kind of scary compared to the little ones that we deal with here. So these are plants that like to grow in nutrient poor, especially nitrogen poor environments, usually in bogs and fens. And they supplement their diet, particularly nitrogen, by eating tiny animals, by eating insects that fall into the traps. And uh, the, the leaf itself originates from the base of the plant. It comes up into this jug or pitcher form. It's, it's fused all the way around, so it's watertight and it will hold rainwater. And over time, that pitcher will fill up with rainwater. And uh, the goal of the plant is to have insects trapped in that water that it can then digest. And what happens is an insect will typically crawl up the side and then fall in. Sometimes they may fly in, but they get stuck in the water. Uh, if a flying insect is in the water, it often has a hard time lifting back off because the wings are wet and heavy. So if an insect tries to crawl out on the outside or the, the backside in this photograph, the hood of the plant, the, the part of the leaf that sticks up there in the back, is covered with these strong hairs that point downward. And that prevents an insect from get, getting any kind of a hold as it tries to escape the pitcher. It can claw its way up, but it will just keep slipping off of these hairs. So the, the insect eventually just gets exhausted and falls back into the water. 
On the other side, the side closer to the camera in this photo is a very smooth, slippery surface. So the same thing happens over there. Even though it doesn't have the hairs, the insect just kind of claws away and can't get a grip on anything and just keeps ending up back in the water. So eventually the insect will just drown and, uh, and uh, be within the, the water within that pitcher. So one of the most interesting things about this plant is that the rolled surface that you see on the closer side of the opening to the pitcher is very slippery. And beyond that lip, just inside the actual jug or the pitcher are little nectar glands. So it encourages little insects and other arthropods and, and tiny creatures to crawl up the side of the pitcher and hold on as they peer down and lean over this slippery edge. And so it's an easy way to have these insects accidentally fall into the water. Uh, if that doesn't work, the nectar glands also produce a tiny bit of alcohol inside the nectar. So if this insect is drinking away at this nectar and not falling in, eventually it probably will lose its grip or lose its balance and end up in the water. Once it does end up in there, there's another thing that happens and I'll get to that in just a second after I talk about the flower here. So in the right photo, on the far right side, you can see this little little ball emerging from the ground. That is the unopened flower. On the left photo, you can see the open flower and that raises several feet above the pitchers. And there's two good reasons for that. One is that they don't want their insect friends who are pollinating the flower to end up in the pitcher. And the other reason uh, that that tall flower stalk is, is beneficial is that it raises up above a lot of the other bog plants. Many bog plants are fairly short small shrubs like leather leaf and bog rosemary and cranberries and things. These are all fairly low growing plants. And if you can raise your flower up three feet or three and a half feet, then you're raising yourself above those other plants. And it's kind of like a flag calling in your pollinator, uh, pollinator friends to come and visit the flower. So uh, getting back to the other interesting thing about the pitchers, there are a couple of insects that live within that pitcher and they are not harmed by the liquid inside of the pitcher. They live in there. That's in fact the only place that these two species of uh, insects live in their larval stage of their life. There's one that's the uh, Wyomaya, which is a mosquito. And then there's also the pitcher plant midge, Metrionemus. And those two, two species of insect only live in that pitcher. The benefit to the pitcher there is that these insects are predatory and they attack the, the drowned carcasses of these other insects that drown in the water. And so they help to shred up those other insects into small pieces and facilitate the decomposition of those insects. And also they are consuming pieces of these drowned insects and then pooping out that material and, and basically converting it within their bodies to a more readily absorbable form by the plant. So um, they help to digest, if you wanna call it that, help the pitcher plant digest these prey items that fall into the pitcher. So really interesting relationship. There was a study looking at the fitness of pitcher plants, whether they had mosquitoes, the pitcher plant mosquito or the pitcher plant midge within the liquid inside the pitcher or not. And they actually found that there wasn't any difference in fitness. They were using nitrogen content of the leaves as a variable that represented the fitness of the plant. And they expected to see that they would be a much more a healthier stand of pitcher plants if they had a lot of these insects inside. But in fact, that wasn't really the case. So um, it's interesting, it doesn't seem to benefit the pitcher nearly as much as it benefits the mosquito and the midge having a nice safe place to live. All right, here's the next one. Let's see if anybody knows what this one is. This is a good job, Emily, bottle gentian. Yeah, this is a really pretty slow growing perennial that's native to Wisconsin and much of the Great Lakes region, the Northern states of the East Coast. Um, it is one of the few really vibrant blue flowers that we have here in Wisconsin. It's not a common color that we see, um, but this is really a, a really spectacular plant. Um, 
one of my favorites that I see along lake shores and especially along stream banks. Uh, that would include things like impoundments as well. Anywhere there's a little bit of water fluctuation, um, it's, it's really a, a good place to find this plant. It, it can grow in part shade to almost full shade. In the full shade situations, it usually starts out in the shade and it kind of reaches out over the, the water to seek more light and then it falls down because of the, the amount of reaching that it's doing. So it'll sort of be creeping along the ground instead of standing up um, like you'd see in this photo. So this is a really an interesting one for, um, for rain gardens and other wet shoreline sites. If you're looking to do any kind of native landscaping around your home, this is a really neat spot, a neat, neat plant to put in a spot that is wet. And I forgot to put the title up there. One of the coolest things about this one though, is that the flowers, uh, they have five petals that are connected all the way around. They're not separated at all. But in between each of the petals, there is a bunch of folded or wrinkled petal tissue in there. So it allows the petals to spread apart without breaking or tearing. But in the wild, this is really the as far open as those flowers will go. The only way they will open further than that is if a bumblebee comes to visit and shoves its way into the flower. And I was able to capture that a few years ago with a video. Um, I saw this bottle gentian was sort of wobbling. The one particular flower was wobbling around and uh, I was pretty sure I knew what was going on there. So I started taking a video to see what would happen next. So you'll see it here. You can see there's actually a creature inside. The legs are coming out every once in a while. He's trying to find his way out. And as that bumblebee is moving around inside that flower, it is gathering nectar, but also rubbing up against the stamens within the flower and capturing pollen on its on its hairs that will be then be taken to another flower. So off he goes to visit another flower and deposit that pollen and then carry pollen from that second flower onto the third one. So really nice, really neat uh, adaptation that that plant has there. All right, next one is this very large floating plant. Many people don't realize this is a native species to Wisconsin. Looks, yep, good job, Gene. Uh, American Lotus, it is sort of similar to a water lily. Water lilies typically have their flowers sitting right on the water surface and Lotus will uh, raise its flowers a couple feet above the water. The other big difference is in the pad. One. The water lily pad will have a notch or a cut in it that goes from where the stem attaches to the leaf all the way to the outside. And lotus leaves do not have that. They are circular, they are entire, they don't have any notches or, or cuts in them. They are also extremely water repellent. As you can see in the lower left photo there, the uh, the, the upper surface of the leaf is covered in an extremely fine coating of hairs that are hydrophobic or water repellent hairs. And so if you splash water on the leaf, it just rolls right off. If it rains, it all just sheds off to the sides. You can hold that leaf underwater for minutes and then let it come back up and it will be completely dry when it comes up. Uh, it, it cannot be wetted. And this leaf here was actually the inspiration for the Gore-Tex line of clothing. Uh, same idea there to create a hydrophobic suit. Uh, they mimic the, the tiny hairs that line the, the upper surface of the lotus leaf. So it's always fun whenever I see lotus to just quickly splash a little bit of water on there and just let, let it roll around. It looks really neat. Uh, what you see on the, the right photo with the flower there, though, that is an enormous flower. Uh, think about a water lily, a white water lily flower in your lake and double that. And that's the size that these lotus flowers can get to. They're very, very large, very impressive. Um, there are some big stands of it that you can see along the Highway 41 bridge on Lake Butamore, south of Oshkosh. Um, very impressive multi-acre stand of it over there. It's pretty common in the Winnebago system and the pool lakes, uh, Lake Poygan, Butamore, Winnicani and uh, in a few lakes around Wisconsin. It's not as common in lakes, 
more common in large impoundment type situations or large rivers like the lower Wisconsin River or the Mississippi River. The low, uh, upper left photo there is the seed head. It looks much like a big shower head. The seeds inside when they're green can be boiled and eaten like peas. It's a very common uh, or historically important species for Native American cultures. They ate the, the seeds and also the rhizomes primarily. The rhizomes are the underground creeping stems and those are giant starch reserves. A lot of other aquatic plants have those as well. And it's a way for the plant to store energy away for the winter. The lotus rhizomes can be sliced real thin like sliced potatoes and fried up and that's uh, that was used as a carbohydrate source. The seeds, as I said, when they're green can be boiled like peas or when they're mature seeds, they were actually roasted and, and eaten like nuts. And a couple of the other common names for this species originated from its food value. And so it's called things like water acorn and duck acorn, water nut. Uh, alligator corn, things like that, um, explaining its, its proximity to the water and its uh, benefits as a food source. So very cool plant. All right, next one. What is this? This is a group of submerged plants, bladderworts. It is the common bladderwort, as Emily said, yep. So we have eight different species of bladderworts here in Wisconsin. We have six that have yellow flowers. We have two that have purple flowers. They all are photosynthetic, but also supplement their diet with insects, much like the pitcher plant did. And uh, in this case, the common bladderwort has bladders all over the place. You can see hundreds of bladders in this photograph where every leaf has multiple bladders on it. And this one just floats around typically right under the surface. It is not a rooted plant. It floats around and typically gets uh, stuck on other vegetation and just sits near the surface. A lot of flying insects lay their eggs right there on the surface of the water and then the larvae develop in that warm calm area near the surface in between a lot of vegetation. So it's a good place for the bladderwort to be where there's going to be an abundant food source. And things like Daphnia or copepods, little midge larvae, mosquito larvae, uh, anything that's only a couple millimeters or so in length or smaller than that would be potential prey items for this species. The little insect shown here is a midge larva, just to give you an idea of what that would look like. And on the lower photo here is a close up of the bladders of a different species that we have here, the flat leaf bladderwort. And that species has the uh, leafy material on uh, a different branch than the bladders. The bladders are all underground. The leaves are all above ground on different branches. So those are photosynthesizing. And the ones, uh, the branches that go down into the soil or the sediment of the lake are containing only bladders and not leaves. The bladders on all these species operate pretty much the same way. They have a, a leafy tissue here that is attached to the branch. And on the outside of the bladder, there are these things called trigger hairs. And those hairs are connected to a valve right here, right at the opening of the bladder. That valve can swing inward, but not outward. And this bladder itself can pump water out of itself so that it creates a low pressure area inside or a vacuum inside. So when an invertebrate comes along and it hits these trigger hairs, those hairs signal the valve to open, to swing inward, and it takes a little gulp of water because there's low pressure inside. So when that valve opens, some water rushes in and whatever happens to be sitting there next to these trigger hairs is gonna come in with that water. In this case, what happened, you can picture this little wave of water coming in. It flew into the bladder here and then hit the back and started curling up. And eventually there was enough pressure in the bladder that it closed that valve. And what happened was this little midge larva, probably, I, I didn't cut it open, but I should have. So I would, I would know the answer to it when I talk about this. It looks like based on the shape, probably a midge larva or maybe a mosquito larva. 
that got pulled in here and is then trapped inside the bladder. There are no enzymes or anything that are produced. The, the bladder just relies on natural decomposition of that insect from bacteria that are already in the bladder or came in with the water or the insect. And it just decays in there. And as it rots over time, the um, compounds within the body of the insect are then absorbed by the plant. And it uses that to supplement primarily its nitrogen intake and some mineral intake as well from the bodies of those insects. These are a couple of other species that are not nearly as common and certainly not as conspicuous. Um, they are both considered fairly rare, but they are so small and so hard to notice that they're probably underreported as well. So they're probably more common than we think. Um, the one on the left, that's actually a picture from Spring Lake in Washera County, not a lake that we would expect to see that species on. I see a volunteer from Spring Lake is on the, on the meeting here today. Um, so that was really exciting to find it in that lake. That's usually it's in very acidic sandy lakes, but here it was in a hard water marl bottom lake, not where you'd expect to find it. But in fact, there's another lake 10 miles from there that has this species as well. It's the, the small purple bladder wart. So um, they're, they're around and our understanding of its preferred habitats may actually be a little bit inaccurate because it's so hard to notice if it is there. The one on the right is the horned bladder wart up in Oneida County. Um, usually that species is not even that conspicuous. That's only a, an inch or so tall and uh, just occurring on the outside of a mat of peat. But a lot of times that is actually completely within the sand or sediment, and it might just be a, a fraction of an inch sticking out, and that's it. So a very, very hard species to notice if it is present. All right, and here's all the different species of bladderworts that we have here in Wisconsin. They all produce flowers. They're all insect pollinated, have a little bit different designs between the different species. But for the most part, these are pretty small flowers. So you're talking a centimeter or two um, for most of them or less. And the large purple bladderwort up in the upper right is a little bit bigger than that, but still pretty small. And some of them are hard to even notice even if they are flowering. If you see the large purple bladderwort flowering and there's a bunch of those, you can't miss it. But a lot of the other ones are easily missed. All right, how about this one? There are actually two species of the same genus shown here. Sundew, yep. Good, so we have a couple, couple different ones represented here. We have Drosera rotundifolia here, the round leaf sundew, and then Drosera intermedia. Here, the spoon leaf sundew with a little round leaf sundew hiding in there as well over here. And the intermedia commonly has this reddish color to it too. So it's, it's a pretty striking plant when you do get to see it. Neither one of these are really all that rare. If you find the right habitat, which is again, a nitrogen poor bog or fen, you'll likely find sundews if you look for them. The picture on the right in particular is deceiving. It, it kind of looks like this might actually be a fairly large plant, but they are pretty small. So you're talking about a plant that is maybe three, three inches, maybe four inches in diameter for a large clump. So they're pretty small and they're often smaller than that. So you have to look for these plants usually to be able to find them. Um, they're really interesting plants in that they have these little hairs covering each leaf and each hair is covered in a sticky droplet that looks like nectar to a plant, or sorry, to an insect. And it also secretes a, a sweet smell from the nectar as well. So, or sorry, from the sticky secretion that the insects think is nectar. So these insects will come in thinking that they're going to feed on this nectar that are on these hairs. And it turns out it's just a sticky glue that traps them. And that's how the insect is, uh, is caught by the sundew plant. So I have a video that we can watch here. That's actually, oh, just a sec, I will have the to The reason switch. I love using StreamYard, well, that's easy. I'll have to switch over to my other window. So just a minute here. All 
All right. We'll have to watch a couple I can seconds make, of an me, ad Chris here Brogan, first. I can make a show. Okay. All right. So here is Drosera capensis. It's not a species that we have here, but it operates the same way. And you can see that as the insect struggles, it actually causes the plant to pull more of those hairs in and slap more of that glue onto the insect. And once that starts to happen, that's it. Uh, it. It starts to roll the whole leaf up and really contain that insect so that there is no hope of it getting away at that point. the other screen now. All right, so yeah, once they get rolled up in the leaf like that, they have lots of hairs that have touched them and, and released that glue onto them. The insect will basically drown in the, a coating of the sticky secretion on, from those leaves. And that also contains enzymes. So it will start to break down the insect's body and the compounds within that body will be absorbed into the leaf. The leaf will then unroll after a while and reset and the dried up carcass of that insect will just fall off or blow away in the wind and the, the leaf can be reset to capture another insect later in time. So we have four species here in Wisconsin. We have the, the two that are pictured here, which are the more common two. The other two are, are quite rare and they have a very linear leaf like you saw in that video, where uh, it's basically two parallel sides on the leaf and very long and narrow. All right, so then these, this is sort of a, a larger group of several genera that are collectively called something. Uh, I see Lemna is, is coming up as an answer. Lemna is one of the genera within this group. Wolfia is another, not pondweed. They are all collectively called the duckweeds. And these, uh, mostly because when you see young ducks in the spring, they are feeding on this and the ducks are often raised in these backwater pools and calm areas where there's good conditions for duckweeds to grow. So you see them associated with each other quite often. But the interesting thing about duckweeds is that these are very, very, very tiny plants. Some of them, like the large duckweed might get to a, a centimeter or so across, but the other ones are smaller than that. And then the wolfia or the water meal as it's called, or that's the two bottom photos here. They are extremely tiny. And this in fact is the smallest flowering group of plants in the world. Um, the flower is extremely tiny and doesn't have any petals or any showiness to it. It's just a single pistil or a single stamen that comes out of the plant. Um, but it is in fact the smallest flowering plant in the world. And th it feels like little cornmeal grains in your fingers. It's very gritty and stiff but extremely tiny. And they don't have any roots at all on the water meal. They just float around at the mercy of the water currents or the wind, and they absorb nutrients directly through the plant itself. There's no need for any roots or anything. Typically they grow in areas where the nutrient content of the water is fairly high. So you see a lot of them in stormwater ponds and farm ponds, drainage ditches, things like that. And you'll also see the other duckweeds growing there as well. The other ones, Lemna and Spirodella, the Spirodella would be this one here in the upper left. There's another one down here. And then the rest of these are Lemna, Lemna minor, small duckweed. And then Spirodella is, is the greater duckweed or large duckweed. And these little tiny grains in here, just for size comparison, are the water meal grains. So they're all fairly small, but the Lemna and Spirodella do have roots. The Wolfia or the water meal does not. One of the interesting things about these plants is that they grow on the surface and that's fine to grow on the surface in Wisconsin during the warm season, but you don't wanna be on the surface in the cold season. So these plants develop little turions 
just like a lot of our other aquatic plants do, they are vegetative structures that just serve as kind of a starch reserve for the plant. They fall off and they lay on the bottom over the winter and then they expand and they uh, create a new plant, which is a clone of the parent plant the following season. And it's a way for those plants to just go to sleep for a while and come back when the conditions are good again. In the case of these duckweeds, it is life or death. If you don't, you're going to freeze. So it has to form these turions that fall down to the bottom. And those turions then start to expand in the springtime. Once the ice is gone, they start photosynthesizing. They decrease in density. And as they get lighter, less dense, they will float back up to the surface and they'll resume growing for another growing season. So what you see in the photo here is a bunch that have already risen back to the surface in this pond in the spring. Here's a bunch of them on the bottom of the pond here that are still on their way up. They, uh, the whole cluster of the plant may sink. And so the roots in this case of, of these ones are stuck on the bottom and they're trying to raise their, their way back up to the surface. So occasionally you see duckweeds growing to large abundance. Like in this case, this is a backwater of the Mississippi River in Southwest Wisconsin. River backwaters are common areas to see a ton of duckweed that accumulates. And this type of habitat um, spawned the idea for a mythical creature or many mythical creatures, one of them being from England and her name is Jenny Greenteeth. And the duckweeds are actually said to be the shed teeth of Jenny. Jenny pulls small kids in from the shoreline of these ponds and drags them in and drowns them and consumes them. And as in that process, sheds her teeth into the pond. And so that's what all these little green floating uh, tooth shaped things are floating on the pond. It was a way for people to encourage kids to stay away from the water. When they're out playing in little groups or by themselves, the idea was to tell the kids don't go anywhere near these little ponds because of the risk of drowning. Um, but the story of Jenny Green Teeth and these other mythical creatures that live in these little ponds were effective at keeping kids away from these places that might be harmful to them. So in a uh, in fact, one of the common names still used in England for lemna or for the duckweed group is Jenny Greenteeth. That is actually just a common name for the plant over there. All right, how about this one? This is a long ribbony plant that grows in the bottom of lakes and rivers. All the leaves are attached to the base. Water celery, perfect, Vallisneria. So this one is uh, an important food plant. It is a very nice aquatic plant for structure, uh, for food, um, for different kinds of aquatic animals, for shelter and spawning habitat, for a lot of fish, uh, food for invertebrates. It provides a lot of benefits to an aquatic system. And it is perhaps most valuable to the canvasback duck. As the canvasbacks are migrating through Wisconsin, it is an extremely important food source and uh, a dominant food source for that particular species. And the importance of this plant is reflected in the Latin name of the canvasback. The water celery's Latin name is Vallisneria americana. The canvasback duck's Latin name is Athea vallisneria, which is named after this plant because of the close association between those two species. The flower of Vallisneria or water celery, the female flower that is, is, is seen on a spiraling stalk in the middle of the summer. And this raises up to the surface and the female flower is at the very tip, which creates a little dimple in the water's surface that where the surface tension of the water kind of wraps around this flower. So it creates this tiny dimple in the water. The male flowers are produced at the base of the plant and they contain the pollen that must get from the bottom of the plant up to the surface and that may be six or seven or eight feet down but for some strange reason the, the pollen of water celery cannot touch water because it will swell up and explode if it touches water so the male flowers 
are formed at the base of the plant and they release, they're, they're buoyant. They contain the pollen in basically a little sealed capsule that rises up to the surface. And when it gets to the surface, it will open up into this little boat. There are three sepals on the flower that curve down and they form this sort of tripod shaped boat that floats around and the stamens that contain the pollen are sticking straight up away from the water surface. So as far away from the water as they can be. And then the wind or the water currents will push these male flowers around on the surface. And if one of them's lucky, it will land in a dimple of a female flower. It'll basically be floating along and then tip into the dimple and hopefully drop some pollen into the female flower or the stamens will directly contact the flower of the female and then pollination happens. Most of the time, I think these male flowers are not this lucky and they just they just flush over to the lake shore or the, the river shore and they rot away. And a lot of the vegetation, uh, or sorry, the reproduction of Vallisneria would be through uh, vegetative means, just through rhizomes and um, fragments and things like that, instead of the sexual reproduction making seed by a male flower contacting a female. But it does happen. And when it does happen, you see the, the coiled stalk of the female flower become much more strongly coiled and it starts to pull the female flower down into the water to develop into a fruit. There are less uh, pests and dangers underneath the water than there are above. There's less risk of weather damaging the developing fruit or waves. A lot of terrestrial insects will eat aquatic plant leaves and structures that are on the surface. So it gets, them, gets these fruits away from that. It's basically just a safer place for those flowers to develop. You see the same phenomenon in white water lilies. You'll see the flowers for a few weeks and then all of a sudden they're all gone and there's no evidence of them anymore. But what's happened is once they're pollinated, they are pulled down by a coiled stalk and they develop underwater. So if you went snorkeling under a bunch of water lilies, you would see the coiled stalks with the developing fruits on them, much as you would with the water celery. So here's an illustration of what that male flower looks like with those three sepals that are pointed down a little bit, forming this little boat and holding the pollen up above the water. Here is the left, uh, the female flower again on the left side, and then those little white specks on the right photo are the male flowers stuck on a bunch of water celery leaves near the shore. And I was lucky enough a few years ago to find both of these. The male flowers are kind of hard to find. The females are not hard to find at all, but uh, it was nice to be able to get this comparison photo between the two. So you can see that the dimple around the female flower is actually kind of sizable compared to the size of a male flower. So it may seem really unlikely that the male is going to find this, this dimple in the water, but maybe there's a better chance of it than we think based on the size of the female flower here. All right, so moving back to the bog, here's another species that occurs in bogs and flowers really early in the season, has this beautiful pink and black flower, uh, even in mid-May or so in Northern Wisconsin, you'll see this one blooming already, just as the bog is starting to thaw. Anybody know what this one is? Bog laurel, perfect. Yeah, so this is our only species of Calmia here, the bog laurel. This is a little shrub. It is a woody plant that grows to maybe two feet or so tall, maybe two and a half if you're lucky, if it's a prime specimen. So it's a fairly short shrub and blooms very, very early in the season. The leaves are evergreen, so you'll see those any time of the year, and then the flowers come out right away in the spring. The cool thing about the bog laurels is that they have stamens that developed tucked into the petals. So you can sort of see these stamens uh, radiating out from the center of the flower and, and pushing into the petals just a little bit. They are held under tension. And as an insect lay, lands on the style in the middle, that little stalk that sticks up from the center, as they're moving around, their legs are hitting those stamens. And a lot of insect legs have little hooks on them for helping them attach to leaves or, or any surface that they might be crawling on. And so those little hooks on their legs get caught on the stamens 
And as they are moving around, they will trip some of these stamens and the stamen will spring up and slap the side of the insect, depositing pollen on the side of that insect or on the back or whatever part of the insect that it hits. So the, the insects just go by from one flower to the next and just get assaulted by these stamens hitting the pollen into the, the insect and then it moves to the next flower, it transfers pollen to the next flower, gets whacked a few more times and then moves to the next flower and continues on. These stamens do not reset. So once they are uh, tripped for the season, that's it, they're, they're done. They've transferred their pollen, they've, they've performed their function and the, the bee does the rest. So I do have a video of this one also on a different species of Calmia that doesn't occur here, but the, the idea is the same. So I will bring that up and switch screens again to show that. All right, so here you can see the bumblebee is, is flying around visiting a lot of these flowers of the Calmia latifolia. We'll get to the part where it's actually getting where these are being tripped. So this person is actually just demonstrating what happens when something lifts up on these stamens. You can see they very quickly slap toward the inside. And if there was an insect sitting there in the center, it would be getting hit with these stamens all over its body. All right, I'll go back to the other one. No. Okay, now how about this one? I'm not sure if anybody will notice or will recognize this one. It is more common in fens uh, and alkaline wetlands. It is not a very friendly plant, not water willow. It's one you, yeah, Troy's got it. It's poison sumac. So this is related to poison ivy. We have two different species of poison ivy in, in Wisconsin. One is a ground cover and one is a climbing plant that you see mostly in the southwestern part of the state. This is a 20 foot tall shrub. Uh, it is completely different than the sumacs that you see on the roadside. So don't, don't be afraid of touching a sumac that you see growing in a dry site near your house. Uh, completely different but it has a similar appearance, which is where the sumac name comes from here. Um, this has very large compound leaves and big clusters of berries that droop down underneath. The bark is very gray and it's got these kind of scraggly, wrinkly branches, um, kind of like a, a sumac would on the roadside, the different kinds of sumac, smooth sumac or the staghorn sumac. But this one, uh, tends to be in these very wet alkaline environments, which are areas that you would never see a, one of the other sumacs growing in. It has a really striking appearance in the fall. If you go into an alkaline wetland in the fall, some of the things are turning colors. This is one of the most striking plants in the fall. It turns a really dark red. So it's actually pretty, pretty attractive. Um, but this is not attractive. This is what your arm will look like, or this is what my arm looked like uh, about eight or 10 years ago when I got into some poison sumac oil. And uh, what happens is you could touch a leaf of poison sumac and you're, you'll be fine. But if you break the leaf and you come in contact with the oils that are inside the leaf, that's where the big problem comes in. And what I did I knew what poison sumac looked like, and I was in an area where I knew there was poison sumac, but I was actually working in the soil, and I was not near a poison sumac plant, as far as I know, but uh, somewhere in that soil, there was obviously some residue of the oils from maybe leaves had blown over there, or berries had been deposited there, or something like that but I had my forearms in the, in the soil and both of my forearms looked like that. So that was not pleasant. It took about a week of hydrocortisone cream uh, multiple times a day to try to relieve the itching of that. And um, it was really a horrible experience that I'll, I hope to never experience again. I've never uh, awakened during the night 
scratching both forearms at the same time. If you cross your arms in front of you and use each hand to scratch the opposing forearm, that's what I was doing in my sleep. Uh, it was very unpleasant. So hopefully I never have to deal with that again. So beware if you see a plant like that in a, an alkaline wetland in your area. You'd be most likely to see it in the southern half of the state or up into uh, Eastern Marathon County or Shawano County. I've seen it in, in those areas as well. But um, if you're in the northern part of the state, north central, northwest, you're pretty unlikely to see poison sumac. All right, how about this one here? This is a really common plant along lake shores. It's an annual jewelweed. Yep, orange jewelweed, Impatience capensis. We have yellow jewelweed as well. If you ever go for a walk in a moist woodland, especially near a spring seep that's coming out of the ground, you'll see the yellow flowered version, which is uh, Impatience pallida. And that one is fairly common as well, but again, usually in more, uh, moist woodlands rather than along lake shores. So this plant has these swollen joints in the stem. It's got these bulges wherever there's a leaf coming into the stem. And within those joints, there is a watery sap inside that plant. And it's an, it's an itch relieving sap or it has an itch relieving qualities to it. So if you're ever out and you get hit with stinging nettle, especially that's what this is often used for, because they grow in close proximity to them, uh, each other. Um, you can crush up the stem of jewelweed and you can just take that whole crushed stem and all and just rub that on your, on your itch, wherever the stinging nettle got you. And it's, it does a great job of relieving the itch immediately from the stinging nettle. Usually nettles will only itch for a few minutes. It's not a big deal, but if you don't wanna deal with that for a few minutes, you can find some jewelweed nearby and you can crush it up and rub it on there and uh, get the itch to go away faster. So it's also called touch me not for uh, a reason completely unlike the poison sumac. It is not a harmful plant. There's no risk to you of touching the jewelweed. Um, it's called touch me not because the fruits are explosive and they, they use this explosive quality of the fruit to disperse the seeds, maybe four to five feet from the parent plant. They don't go too far, but they get shot out pretty fast and they can uh, get launched out from the parent plant a little ways uh, to help it disperse along a lake shore. Um, last thing I have here today is this video and this is at least 12 years old I think so the resolution is not great but you can see you can see the idea well enough here um, this is my assistant's fingers here and she is squeezing the base of the fruiting capsule of jewelweed so here's a branch where it was flowering, the flowers then turned into these fruits. There are seeds inside. Usually there's three to five seeds inside. And as I said, it's called touch me not because if you brush up against the plant when it's in fruit like this, these clusters will just explode and you'll see seeds flying all over the place. Um, I didn't realize at the time, but there's actually a spider sitting here on the, the fruit that's about to explode. So that was interesting to see when we got back to the computer and could see this a little bit bigger. But uh, here you go, you'll see, this is slowed down to about 300 frames per second. And then I slowed it down at the end to about a thousand frames per second. So it's really, really slow motion at the end. And you can see what happens here. So a little bit of disturbance to the outside of the fruit and it explodes, the spider went flying and you can see those seeds got launched pretty good. Uh, there was a, I believe it was a folder or a binder or something next to it just for the a solid background behind the, the cluster there. And that's what you can see the seed bouncing off of there. So it's actually really fun for kids, especially if you have kids or grandkids that hang around your lakeshore and you've got some jewelweed. It's endless fun for them to just go by and poke the, the fruiting clusters of the jewelweed and just watch them explode all over the place. So uh, good times with that plant. So that is it uh, for my presentation. Next 
month is wild rice in Wisconsin. So catch us next month on the 31st at 3 p.m. for that one. If there are questions about any of these other species that I talked about though, I'm happy to take those. So I'll wait a minute to see if anyone has any questions.